afternoon hour. We are pleased to have with us Doug McNamee, a good friend for a long time. This will be fun. You enjoy hearing great stories from Doug about his time at Baylor. 2003, his uh, BA degree, 2005, his master's in sports management from Baylor University, uh, entwined in Baylor athletics during his time as a student at Baylor and then post that working here in a number of roles. And then uh, when he uh, moved on from Baylor, he was the senior associate AD for external affairs and fundraising here at Baylor and now has uh, moved on to the Magnolia Empire where he is president of Magnolia. And we'll talk all about that and talk about those, uh, you know, his journey along the way. Doug is a, uh, as Walter said, a member of the Bee Association also. So without further ado, welcome in the pride of Lake Jackson, Texas, Baylor grad, Doug McNamee. Doug, appreciate you being with us. Hey, Bucky's and, and Doug McNamee from Lake Jackson. They're, they're, that's all you need in life, right? Two claims to fame, exactly, from Lake Jackson. That's great. Hey, thanks for agreeing to do this with us. Uh, this is fun. And it's kind of a good uh, good day to be inside uh, doing this virtually today. Absolutely. I uh, I miss a lot of things about Baylor, but hearing your voice through the wall, because we were separated in uh, Simpson by a wall, and hearing you get to do uh, the radio show and different different things from your office is, is definitely one of them. So a good day for a virtual event. The uh, window behind me isn't cloudy by nature. It's just frozen uh, water on the window up there. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's not fake either. That is uh, absolutely uh, true frost there. Absolutely. Hey, uh, as we start out, let's go back to Lake Jackson. Let's go back right. to your time. Uh, how'd you get to Baylor? What was the allure that, that brought you to Baylor initially? Yeah, Baylor has always been um, a part of our family. I think like so many families, you know, there's just such a, a, a legacy tie to the university. A grandfather was um, actually the, the dean of the School of Education at Baylor in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, dad went to school here, uh, big sister went to school here, aunts, a lot of cousins. Um, so Baylor is just a school I always grew up rooting for. Everyone at, at my high school would, would know I'd be wearing the Baylor sweatshirts everywhere, be listening to the games on the radio, getting to look forward to when they played Houston or Rice to, to catch a game in Houston um, when they would play here. So it's always been, uh, it's always been pretty much, a, I think, a foregone conclusion for me that Baylor was going to be a destination. And then to actually get the opportunity to come there was, was a dream come true for me. Gotcha. And your, your uh, bachelor's degree was in speech. Is that right? Speech communications. Yeah. I wanted to, wanted to make sure I could get something that uh, would be helpful, but not take too much time away from my focus, which was being involved in sports. So that was a, yeah. a good combination for that. That's good. And you jumped right in, in athletics. You worked with uh, Baylor basketball really from day one, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I, I was involved as a, a student in high school supporting our, our men's basketball uh, team and um, knew I wanted to be involved in sports and obviously didn't have the physical capabilities to participate by playing. And so um, it really felt like this was a great opportunity to stay connected and stay involved and got a chance. And, um, you know, our, our, our success on the court was certainly limited during the four years that uh, I was able to work with our basketball team. But the experiences, the opportunities to meet people, to get an understanding of how athletics and college athletics specifically work um, was exactly what I needed. How was that? Uh, how, how did that work initially? Like, did you make contact with uh, Coach Bliss or someone in the basketball office before you got here and said, hey, I'd like to do this? Or did you do it when you got on yeah. campus? Or how that work? Uh, my, my high school basketball coach, a, 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 a dear dear friend and a mentor of mine, is, uh, was, was kind enough to connect actually with Harry Miller at the time. It was before, um, before Coach Bliss had arrived. And so we, we had gotten the connection and lined up. And obviously in that summer um, of transition when Coach Miller was let go and, and Coach Bliss was hired, um, work with the staff uh, to get a, a spot to support uh, the basketball team and, and uh, got a lot of experience during those four years. Again, not, not, not necessarily the on-court on success we'd hoped for, but had a chance to really um, learn, understand how college athletics work by working directly with the program um, and had a great time doing it. Yeah. Uh, you talk about working from the ground up. I mean, that's it from the ground floor, you know, as a manager with Baylor basketball, I did that for four years. Uh, and then at one point you switched over to baseball and worked with coach uh, Steve Smith at baseball. Yes. It's, it's, it's my time winded down to undergrad um, again, good experience, but, but knew certainly that uh, probably would be beneficial to get a, a little bit more experience in another program. And so I, I, I went and, and did an internship with the Astros for the summer of 2003, which again, amazing experience worked in the, ticket office and, and was there during the killer B run when they were um, extremely successful and but knew I wanted to come back and, and college athletics was where I ultimately wanted to be. And so I, I before I left for that internship had, had talked to Coach Smith 
and committed to come back and be in a GA role supporting the baseball program. Um, and uh, ha had a, a had my set set my sights on that pretty firmly. Um, that summer obviously was the year that uh, the transition to Coach Drew occurred. And so when I came back that fall for uh, to to get ready to go to school and get to work, I went over and met Coach Drew and Coach Driscoll and the new coaching staff. And they said, "Hey, we 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 don't have anybody here that's been here." And obviously they they completely turned over the staff. Um, and we would love somebody that could help get us in the right direction and, and point us where everything's at. And I felt convicted that moment because you could tell in first beating Coach Drew, this guy's special. He's going to do amazing things here. Um, but I had that commitment that I made to Coach Smith and, and wanted to honor that. So I told Coach Drew, hey, I'll do everything I can. I've, I've got to honor this GA opportunity that Coach Smith gave me. Uh, but anything I can help you with, obviously, I, I'm, I'm going to be your biggest fan and, and advocate and anything I can do. I'd love to do for you. So that's how I ended up with the baseball program. The baseball program was great. Uh, 2005, obviously, summer that uh, we can all remember, College World Series trip. So had the experience that I was hopeful for, got to learn a lot, got to see uh, a program experience its heights in terms of going to the College World Series. Um, and so great, great time in graduate school as well, too, with Coach Smith and baseball program. And I know you've stayed close to uh, Coach Drew and the basketball program, really all of our sports, you know, since then. Uh, I know you, like a lot of us, really appreciate what he's done and what this team is doing this year. Yeah, I mean, Coach Drew, it, first of all, I owe my marriage to Coach Drew. He's the one who introduced <laughs> me to my wife. Um, and so obviously permanently indebted for that. But um, I will just say, I, I know I know we all are appreciative of him. I don't, I don't think that we'll ever truly be able to, uh, to, to show the gratitude that he's deserved for what he's done. I, I think this year um, is the capstone of the greatest transformation of a, a program in the history of college sports. And that, that sounds probably dramatic and maybe drastic, but I think it's unquestionably true. What he's done, you see the stats they throw up during, during a broadcast where it talks about you know, being ranked twice in the history of the program prior to Coach Drew arriving, and now it's like 400 games. You don't even, you can't even keep track of it. Um, but I think what he's done here, and Baylor is blessed with incredible coaches, so to single one out is is a little bit dangerous because there's so many good ones there. But what Coach Drew has done here, the fit that he is, um, I, I think we as a as a community, as a fan base, uh, we we can never be grateful enough for for what he's made possible here and, and support his program at the level um, that it deserves. We, we, we owe him a great, deal, a great deal of gratitude for sure. Yeah, amen to that. Was it Scott or was it Kelly that said, hey, we've got this babysitter that, yeah. that you need to meet? Well, uh, Kelly was definitely the one uh, manipulating the, the, the action right. behind the scenes. Right. But, but Scott called me at 7 a.m. one morning <laughs> and just said out of the blue, and of course this time I'm working in, in ISP and just said, hey, I, I need you to do me a favor. And you know, what, what's Coach Drew calling at 7 a.m. in the morning? He said, I need you to take this girl out on a date. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, hey, whatever you need, Coach. I, I'll, yeah, I'm no, whatever you need. <laughs> and obviously it worked its way out. He he used to brag and say it was the greatest recruiting job he's ever done. And I said, well, once you started bringing people like Perry Jones and, you know, Jared Butler <laughs> and some of these other guys, like, I, I think you moved past that. But it's still a great story. His, and and he definitely is a, is a key reason why Lacey and I are, 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 were able to meet. That's a great story. And tell everybody, uh, you got two uh, two young ones, two girls. Yeah, a five year old and a three year old. Five year old lost her first tooth last night, so a lot yeah. of excitement around the uh, the McNamee house. She was a little late on her age to lose her teeth, uh, according to her, and uh, so she's pretty excited. But a five year old uh, little girl and a, a three year old um, little girl that we're uh, we're especially proud of for sure. That's great. Hey, there is for those of you that are tuned in. There's a, a Q and A function at the bottom of the screen. If uh, well, during our conversation, if you have a question that pops to mind, you would like uh, me to relay to Doug, just type it in that Q&A right there at the bottom. I'll keep an eye on those and uh, we'll get those right to Doug. So uh, that is open to you that are uh, tuned in and watching us here today. Uh, so in Baylor athletics, started as a manager with Baylor basketball, but then you really worked your way up to the, the highest level. You weren't the athletic director, but you were an associate athletic director here. When you left Baylor, you had some stops along the way that were seemed like it really uh, rounded out your athletic department experience. Yeah, so I, I started, when, when I finished up my graduate degree, started with, with ISP, which is as you know well, the, the corporate sponsorship uh, sales partner uh, rights holder for the university. 
um, it changed multiple acronyms along the way. It's now you Learfield IMG College. It's 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 a mouthful, it. right? Is that, is that that's right? It. <laughs> uh, but th that's the original company. It was an amazing experience. One, I got to work with awesome people like yourself, and I owe you uh, the credit for making that connection. I think you were kind enough to offer my name to the people that were involved in that hire, um, and it just was an amazing experience. The the training, um, learning how to sell, learning how to connect with um, decision makers. Uh, was incredible. Um, a, a special company um, that I still on a regular basis pull, you know, skills and lessons that I learned from those first few years of working with with ISP, IMG, now WME, I, Learfield College. Um, <laughs> I, I pull those on a regular basis and it gave me the chance to work for a, a for-profit entrepreneurial sales driven company, but do so still in the context of college athletics. And so had interaction with other schools, got to work in other environments, but still very closely aligned with Baylor, which was obviously the passion for me. So um, learned a lot, was with them for about seven or eight years. Um, the opportunity to take a leadership role kind of as, as, as my time there progressed. So understood and got to learn how to manage budgets and drive revenue and hit goals, um, which again, all, all very helpful tools that still utilize today and do so in, in the college environment. And, um, you know, right as the time where uh, the, the idea of the stadium started to come about, um, that's that's the the, the uh, conversation uh, at that point for me about potentially making the move over to the athletic department really fostered itself. Um, Ian McCall was was kind enough to recognize you know the sales experience and 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 the the role that I could play and help um, in that moment for us as an institution where we were getting ready to, to try to sell a lot of tickets and, and get people transferred from Floyd Casey over to McLean. And so um, I felt like I'd, I'd, I had uh, achieved what I'd wanted to on the IMG side, learned a lot. Um, and was ready to make the move over to the university. So came over in uh, 2013, just prior to obviously the stadium and opening um, and got to see an incredible build and, and uh, just transformation for us as a, as a football community from, from Floyd Casey to McLean. Oh, by the way, we had a quarterback named Robert Griffin at the time that made us, made us all have a little extra fun um, and get uh, excited about that transition. So um, that's how I moved into the, to, to athletics in, in 2013. How great was that experience going through uh, the design and the build of McLean Stadium? Yeah, I mean, incredible. And, and we all that were involved with the sales process, you know, we, we certainly like to promote the uh, ability to raise the money and the amount of tickets we sold. And the truth of the matter is, is they sold themselves with the buzz and the excitement of the football program, experiencing the success that it had. Um, and just the excitement of, of, camp, of, of football coming back to campus at Baylor and that beautiful backdrop, that's the stadium. Uh, it, it made the job really easy. And so, but to be in there and get to go in and walk that building in advance and then just, you know, never forget that uh, September afternoon when we played SMU and do remember how hot it was, but just yeah. the, the electricity in that building just at kickoff was something I don't think we'll ever forget. Incredible to be a part of for sure. Really cool. Uh, Walter uh, introduced you as a board member for the B Association. You are uh, in, in the B Association, uh, you've got a pretty good story there about that connection. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, just to be in the B Association, incredible honor. I mean, for, for a kid that grew up that was never going to play college athletics, that grew up listening to Cody Carlson on the radio, listening to stories about Walter, um, to now serve on a board that includes like King McClure and Katie Stager and John Topolsky, just names that you, you've always appreciated, admired, and cheered for. Um, I mean, Dutch, uh, as everyone's got a Dutch uh, story, Dutch Schroeder story, but he, he and I got to know each other just lightly through the athletic department, just because he'd, he'd, he'd meander his way through Simpson building and see everybody and greet. And he, he learned of my uh, time as a, a manager for the, the, the basketball team and as a GA for the baseball team. And he really made it his personal quest, I think, with, with Walter's support, with, with Ian's support to ensure that I, I, I got a place as a member of the B Association and, and truly is one of the greatest honors for me to be in the association of, of, of the athletes that, that again, I, I grew up listening to and, and cheered for and, and still do. So um, just, just honored to be a part of that group, um, honored to serve in a, in a leadership capacity amongst just really truly uh, fine uh, men and women that represent the university on a regular basis. Yeah, well said, that's great. All right, uh, we got some questions for you. Uh, one is a comment, actually. This is from Clint. Clint says, Doug was my contact at ISP when I was purchasing sponsorships for a client across about a dozen school football programs around the state, and he was unequivocally the best head and shoulders above all of them. So very nice compliment from Clint there. 
I remember Clint, he was great to work with. He worked with a lot, of, a lot of schools across the state. So I appreciate those words for sure. Very nice, Clint, good to have you with us. Jason Wood asks, is there one Baylor win that stands out in your mind over your Baylor experience? Oh, there, uh, there are so many of them. They, 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 uh, they seem like they all run together. Um, I, I will tell you, maybe the one that's most visible and memorable to me probably isn't one that will quite register with a lot of other folks, but it was in 2000, I guess it would be 2017, and we were 0-9 at Kansas, and we, we, we uh, got Matt Rule's first victory. Yeah. And you remember going to that locker room and, and hearing him speak to the team, and you knew something special was happening because you knew that team had stuck the whole time. And it was almost full circle because you'll remember that game, John, you know, it was, it was a game we could have easily – well, actually, I think we played pretty well and handled them um, uh, pretty well across the game. But it was that one win that we got in that season – but it was full circle because I remember vividly during that game, the Kansas game during Robert's uh, uh, Heisman campaign, where candidly we should have lost. And I yeah. think if we lose that that game against Kansas, Robert doesn't win the Heisman and all the success that we saw behind that doesn't occur. And uh, we pulled out a, a pretty miraculous victory in overtime against Kansas at probably, I guess, five years, six years prior. And then knowing what all we'd gone through during that time and then to come back to that moment and being 0 and 10 or 0 and 9 at the time to see us beat Kansas, you just felt like, okay, the, the, the road's coming back. And then sure enough, you know, the next year we go six and six, you start to feel the pieces coming back. And then obviously in 2000, uh, I guess it was a 19, uh, you know, we had the, the, the sugar bowl run and kind of that special year where we were one play away from making the college football playoff. So I'm going to say uh, one from, uh, from the deep, um, the deep catalog was the one win in 2017 when we beat Kansas in football is probably the most memorable. That's pretty interesting. That's that's very insightful. Most people, you know, would pick another game than that one, but you saw how significant that is. Absolutely. Um, here's a question from Bo Johnson. Bo, Bo says, Doug, your leadership of the Bear Foundation was uh, greatly appreciated. It's incredible what you're building at Magnolia. Congratulations. Not really a question, but a comment there. Uh, Robert Doerr says, which McNamee is going to take over the leadership of Baylor first, Lacey or Doug? Oh, there's no, no question. Lacey is the far more talented one of the couple. She's, she's the most, most highly sought after, uh, individual in our family for sure. She's, she's the far, far more talented one. Very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jake Baskin, you know, played baseball here and Jake is back guy. with us in the Bear Foundation. Uh, Jake says your best coach Smith story from your time as a GA also, a fun fact, Doug holds the all-time record in multimedia sponsorship sales for being the youngest GM in that industry's history. Quite an accomplishment. Jake came from the IMG world, uh, now back to Baylor. Um, I, there's so many good Coach, Coach Smith stories. I think one of my favorite um, Coach Smith stories is the time that we were playing. Uh, I don't remember we were playing, but bottom line is that uh, Paul Witt um, was, I think, our shortstop, and Paul Thorpe may better better reference of this but Paul had a few a few errors in, a, in an inning and I, I think coach Smith went out to the mound and things were imploding and and uh, he, he you know coach Smith had such a drive uh, a sense of humor and I think he had a little sense of humor this but he's like Paul if you make one more error in this in this inning I'm pulling you like his, <laughs> right. his, his, his meeting to the mound had nothing to do with the with the uh, pitching he literally wanted to get uh, Paul to to the mound just to let him know that if he made one more error he was done on the day and maybe done for the year so um, but Coach Smith was great. So many, so many good stories, dry personality that uh, he's got such a great sense of humor. Um, but there's a lot of, lot of, lot of good Coach Smith stories. Very good. Hey, Doug, uh, Glenda Strum is, is tuned in and uh, she says hello to you. Today would have been uh, her and Stanley's uh, yeah. wedding anniversary. So oh, Glenda, we appreciate you. We Absolutely. miss Stanley and, and thanks for your best. note. Stanley's the best. Absolutely. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. All right, let's uh, let's go to Magnolia. Uh, and, and one this question from Scott Salmons will be a bridge from your Baylor days to Magnolia. Scott says, uh, "What's the biggest difference in this new job from other jobs you've held?" Yeah, well, I tell folks um, that the thing that I, I really appreciate the most. I'll give you the two biggest similarities, um, which is that they. The opportunity to produce moments and be a part of like memorable moments. College athletics certainly provides that opportunity. You just know um, every time you go to a game, the memory is being created there. Um, and when you were in the role I had previously, kind of in the engineering producing 
um, side of the game. Uh, you just you just knew you're you're getting to be a part of of creating some memories for people. And the same thing is true for for Magnolia. You just you know all these we we, we averaged 1.5 million visitors a year to the silos pre-COVID, um, and you just you just always see these these trips of you know couples or a, a load a, a bunch of a bunch of ladies on a girls trip. And you just you just know there's these memories that are being created. These are bucket list type trips that these individuals are getting to um, get to be a part of. And so it's it's incredibly cool to be in a role that uh, helps to facilitate that. Um, you know, as, as far as the biggest differences are, are concerned, uh, I think that um, I think it's just the the nature of of a a for profit company versus you know college athletics. There's a few less layers. Um, necessary. I, I've got two people I got to get approval to get to do something on. And sometimes only need one, but yeah. um, Chip and Joe, they're, they're, it's their show. And, and when I need to make a decision, you can move a little bit quicker uh, on that side of things and maybe on the, on the university side, which is, it's understandable. It's just, there's a large, it's a larger organization to navigate through, but I would say that's probably the greatest contrast between the two. That's good. Scott, thanks for that question. Your title, Doug, is president of Magnolia. I say the Magnolia Empire. What, what all, uh, I mean, there's a lot that falls under that umbrella. Yeah, it is a little bit like college athletics. We've got 18, what is 18 varsity sports in college yeah. athletics. And I, we've got like 18, maybe 1800 different businesses within the Magnolia uh, spectrum. So you kind of have to try to allocate, where do you give your time to? Um, there's a lot and it's growing. Um, and I, you know, I would best describe my role as, as, as Chip and Joe are dreamers and visionaries and, and they, chart and kind of decide where we want to go. And then my job is to help lead the team that executes making um, what they want to, to accomplish possible. And so um, it's evolving. There's always something new um, that, that, that the business, there's no, there's no boring days around here because you know that they're going to want to keep growing and, and pushing this forward aggressively. And so that's when I sum up my role and it's, it's probably its most distilled format that that's how I would describe it. That's good. Uh, the and you keep growing, you keep expanding the Mag Magnolia Grounds expansion. That seems to be going very well. Yeah, really proud of it. Um, we opened that back in the fall of last year. Uh, you know, COVID has certainly um, dampened a little bit our ability to promote it and 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 slow foot traffic a little bit. But you know, we we had that original uh, we had the original block there. We had the silos and you had the the bakery and the market itself. Um, and then just slowly over the years, the thing has consistently expanded and you saw the turf added to, that, to the main grounds right in front of the stage and then the food trucks. And that's really where it's been for the last uh, three to four years. And then the last 12 to 18 months is where we've seen essentially the footprint of the grounds double in size. We opened the um, new coffee shop, the Magnolia Press, um, in uh, it's been almost a year and a half ago. That kind of started the first step of, of the growth that you see. Um, then we opened our, our home furniture store. Um, in early 2020. Um, and then you see the addition now of the six new shops of the silos, which are six different theme shops. Um, we have the church that we moved from over off of 10th and Columbus that, that is now restored and on the grounds. Um, and just the whole thing now kind of comes together in, a, I think, a really a special, um, unique way to, to give people great experience. So uh, large expansion um, for us. Uh, we, we, we certainly feel like you know, as we, we roll through um, what's a normal slow season in foot traffic for us, we get through, um, you know, this, this part of the year, we get some of the, some of the bad weather out of the way. Um, and hopefully as, as the uh, COVID becomes more and more controlled, we're very bullish and excited. We feel like uh, our crowds are going to be as big as ever. And we're really set up well in a post COVID world to um, have an environment. I think people are going to feel really safe. A lot of green space, smaller um, store environment, as opposed to one big market. Um, so extremely excited about um, what 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 the grounds are going to hold, and as people are are getting the chance to kind of come see it for the first time, you know you you get really excited, favorable reviews. So I just encourage folks if they haven't been out here, and I know there's a lot of folks in Waco who, you know, a lot of times they stay away from it just from a tourist standpoint is the traffic. But if you haven't been out there, I'm really proud of what we've created. Really love when local, you know, McLennan County um, residents are able to come, especially during the week when it's a little slower. Just think there's a lot of you know, family friendly type act activities and opportunities for people to enjoy. So it's been a long journey. Um, I'm sure that, that we'll have more to go. We've got more discussions as far as what the next uh, growth opportunity is specifically in Waco and beyond, but um, we, we feel like we're at a really cool point now where people can enjoy and appreciate the growth that we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months. 
Speaking of COVID, uh, you obviously reduced crowds you've had, you know, people coming through there. Uh, in what ways have y'all been affected by COVID and how have you navigated those waters? Yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting because of this, you know, diverse business. We've seen it impact us in positive ways. We've seen it impact us in negative ways. I, I think for us as a company, it's been an opportunity really to retrench and refocus and figure out what we need to do to be as strong as we need to be moving forward. But you know, it certainly slowed foot traffic and we had uh, you know, a month and a half where everything in Waco was shut down as everyone was shut down. Um, and that, that was extremely challenging because if you're you know, a business built on foot traffic, it certainly puts a strain on you. And we had, we had furloughs and we had periods of time where not all of our team was able to be with us. Um, it, it's, it, has, it has reduced, you know, our, our, we're, we're seeing slow steady growth in terms of foot traffic uh, in, in, in our, our Waco locations. Uh, we're, I think we're faring pretty well comparatively to a lot of entities that are built, built on foot traffic. We're, you know, we're still down, um, but not far as down as, as probably a lot of other uh, businesses. But as it relates to e-com sales um, has been, been incredible, extremely strong. Um, anything right now that's home related, whether it be furniture, home decor, people are at home. They're wanting to figure out ways to improve their home. They're spending money on their home, knowing that they're going to be there more often. And so we've certainly been in an industry that's benefited from that. So we've seen really strong growth on our e-com um, platform, so magnolia.com. And then all of our, you know, our licensing relationships um, like Target, and you've got the hearth and hand by Magnolia Target has done extremely, extremely well over the last 12 to 18 months, better than you know record um, growth in, in some of those categories. You know, our, our, our realty um, company has done extremely well, continuing to grow as people are buying and selling homes um, faster than others. So there's been challenges and there's there's definitely been you know moments for us, for opportunities for us to grow, but there's been um, you know parts of COVID, I don't think anyone would expect it that have actually provided a blessing for us. And really helped us balance out um, our our, our uh, overall performance through through a, certainly a challenging time. Yeah, really interesting. All right, back to basketball. Jake Johnson is tuned in. He says uh, you're the best basketball manager mentor. You he learned a ton from you. <laughs> oh man, I remember Jake. Good guy. He, he came uh, last year of uh, my time of basketball, and, and he was with Coach Drew and kind of helped get Coach into a, a good spot. Coach Drew as as they transitioned in. That's great. All right, Paul Bloss asked a question. Uh, how did you link up with Chip and Joe? Yeah, that's a great story. Um, they actually had renovated a house for us prior. Um, and so before Fixer Upper Fame, um, they had done a house for us. And, uh, you know, as, as, as the story goes, when, when they were being approached by um, a production company for the opportunity to do another show, we were ready to look for another house in the neighborhood. And so um, just just crazy timing, but the, the house that we ended up wanting to, to choose um, was perfect from a filming standpoint. So we got the, the fun honor of getting to be the, uh, the pilot episode um, for Fixer Upper. And I joke with folks, it was literally five years to the day that the pilot aired is the day that I accepted the role to come back to Magnolia. Wow. Uh, May 23rd, 2013, May 23rd, 2018. Wow. Um, and I joke with folks, I was like, I didn't, I didn't earn it. I don't, I don't have the qual the qualifications or the credentials to deserve that job. But I scratched in pencil into the uh the contract for the, the pilot episode. Like if you guys ever get big and you need uh you need somebody, <laughs> I'm I'm the right. only person you get to do. So uh it's crazy how it all came full circle, but just always had a really great friend friendship with chip and joe um casual but just they you know their biggest fans they were always incredibly supportive of me knowing kind of my ambitions for athletics and so um you know it, it came out of nowhere it was an interesting conversation they were incredibly patient and uh, just their grace and their care in the conversation about me taking this probably one opportunity that i would say to leave college athletics um just showed me their character and who they were and um, you know, obviously the, the rest has been history. It's worked out really well for both of us. That's great. Five years to the day from when Five the pilot. Years to the day. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yeah, exactly. All right. We've got a question uh, about that. They know that uh, this viewer knows that you were on the pilot episode of Fixer Upper. Question is, will we be seeing you more on TV as Magnolia further develops the Magnolia Network? Not for the sake of ratings. We need to, uh, <laughs> we, 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 we know my role, which is behind the camera, not in front of it. Um, so nothing planned currently. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that. We gotta, we gotta keep people tuned in and my face isn't going to do that for folks. So I don't think so at this point. That's great. All right. All right. Glenda comes back with a question. Uh, as a realtor, she sold the castle when it was at its best. 
It was distressing to her to see it disintegrate. Yeah. Is there anything you can reveal about the future of the castle? Yeah, if you live in Waco, if you know Waco, like that's that's a big question. That's always been, um, you know, the castle's obviously been a, a landmark uh, a building in, in Waco and in, in home. Um, here's what I would say: we're we're we are working through that right now. It's not something we've just we've purchased just to sit on. I can tell you, Chip and Joe's intention is to restore the beauty um, that that building deserves. Um, it's challenging because you certainly want to do so in a way that uh, respects and honors the neighborhood and the neighbors that are there. Um, and then, you know, the the cost associated with doing such a project is is challenging. It's significant. You don't you don't flip a a castle for for just a few dollars. So um, we we think we're getting close to an idea that will solve and and be a win for everyone. Um, but we're still working through a couple of 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 aspects to it. But I would just say, Glenda, I, I think that Chip and Joe are dead set on making sure the castle um, is honored and brought back to its 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 deserved beauty. And and I would tell you their tracker. It's pretty good about when they set their mind on something to make accomplish it. It usually happens. So. I, I'd be pretty optimistic that the outcome for the castle is going to be a good one. Very good. Glenda, thanks for that. All right, Amanda Rogers is uh, tuned in. She says, is there one piece of advice along your journey that you would give to others, i.e. your three nephews that would uh, like to follow similar, similarly in your footsteps? Yeah, I, I, uh, I would say keep coming to Baylor games um, is the first, first thing. Make sure you make good grades and, and work really hard so you get to come to school here. Um, but I, I think it's just I think it's it's being focused on ultimately what what you want to do. Um, you know, if you can pass out a three, five year, 10 year kind of, you know, times time frame of where you want to be at that point. Um, you know, I think the most important thing I'd say is, is do what you love. If you if you go to work every day um, and you don't think of it as work and you think of it more as a passion and something that you really enjoy. And I know you're a perfect example of that, JMOs. That, that that will take care of everything in itself. And I, and I, I would say I, I'm blessed to be someone who, um, I guess now of, of almost two decades of working, I never felt like I've gone to work. I've always felt like I've gotten a chance to go do something that I wanted to do that was fun. Um, and and that, that has certainly made this path um, much easier and, and much more enjoyable for sure. That's great. Yeah, amen to that. Hey, Jason Pritchard is on. Oh, Jason says, uh, favorite road trip from your time with basketball? Well, he was on most of those road trips. So, you know, <laughs> I probably should, I should probably, I should probably bounce a few of those back at, back at him. All right. Um, I, I'll go ahead and say, hey, we're amongst friends here. We were, uh, we were, uh, we played Colorado um, and JMO, you were on that trip. We played Colorado. Uh, and we lost a close game. This was uh, in basketball and, and we lost a close game. And it was one of those situations where weather in Colorado had gotten worse overnight or during the game. And we were hoping to get out. And we, we ultimately realized that the airport had been shut down and we weren't getting out. And our hotel was overbooked, so we couldn't get into our hotel. And so we were bouncing around. It, we already lost. It wasn't a good environment. I think we we're bouncing around Boulder, Colorado, trying to find a hotel. We finally found the hotel that we get a basketball team in. And then the next morning, we couldn't fly out of Colorado. We had to drive up to Wyoming, if you'll remember that. Um, and we didn't, uh, we didn't have a bus driver, I think, that was familiar uh, with the uh, geography around there. And so somehow, we didn't end up in Wyoming. Uh, it took us a little while and some detours. Finally got to Wyoming and got out. I think we got home the next day at like 5 or 6 in the afternoon. It was supposed to be the day off. So not necessarily the, uh, the most enjoyable, but definitely one of the most memorable ones. That's pretty good. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> uh, Colorado provided some trips. We had one plane flight, if you remember, to Colorado, where I think I pretty much declared I was done flying. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I was ready to look up a rental car to drive home. <clears throat> so it seemed like we always had a little bit of extra drama when flying into Colorado. That's true. All right, another question. Uh, both Baylor and the Magnolia silos have become Waco landmarks. What do you think the next big thing will be? Well, we got a top golf coming into town. We've got a big, oh, big yeah. going out there. Um, you yeah, know, I, I think this, I don't, I don't know if there's going to be a specific, you know, uh, one individual thing. I think Waco is just set up for incredible growth and uh, it, it's just a great place to live. I think the, the economics of it make it really desirable. It's, there's plenty of, of space to grow. It's right in the middle of Dallas and Austin. It's affordable, great people. You've got, a, you've got higher education. You've got multiple options that are in place there. I think I think Baylor, you you want to you want to bet on a stock, bet, bet excuse me, if you want to bet on stock, bet, bet on Waco. 
I think it's got incredible growth. Our mayor, Dylan Meek, is a good friend, and I think he is an incredible leader um, coming off of a previously incredible leader in Kyle Deaver. I think our city manager is super, super proactive, obviously a lot of great leadership at the university. Um, but I think Waco is just as a whole, as a community, is poised for um, this really special time ahead. I, I know there's so many people that are, are Baylor fans that live elsewhere around the country that are now finding themselves with second homes in Waco. And I don't think that's always been the case, but I think you see more and more of that because people just are coming to appreciate um, just, just the, the ability to live here and what it means. And so I won't call out something specifically. Um, I will call out just the community as a whole and tell you, I think, it, I think Waco is going to continue to grow and continue to be a highly desirable place for people want to live at. That's great. Yeah, that is great. All right, here's another question. Uh, they say, it seemed like you were on an athletics trajectory for most of your career. What made you change course so dramatically? Yeah, I mean, a master's degree in sports management doesn't necessarily prepare you too well for, for, for the role I have today. Um, but I would say it's, it truly was a once in a lifetime type uh, opportunity. And, you know, for me, it was pretty set in my mind, probably not soon after not too long after graduation, that I wanted to be a college athletic director, um, and and certainly was taking steps to hopefully get my position myself in a position where one day that might be possible, um, and wasn't looking for for an opportunity to leave. Mac Rhodes was incredibly kind and supportive, and and uh, you know another great mentor for me for career, and just really was excited about the trajectory with the department for him being there, and so it was uh, it was a great great experience and something I wasn't looking to to leave. Um, but I just saw this 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 company in in Waco um, that had this national presence and this opportunity to be a part of something really really special um, in the leadership aspect. I mean, it's uh, we we're a company of 580 employees, and a lot of people don't realize the size and scope of our company. But just the opportunity to lead and to to hopefully help um, you know uh, create an environment for people, create jobs that that help better their life. Uh, just saw it as a, a great experience, and and you know I I think for me. It, that, that leadership and, and this company is a, a perfect example. You know, the, the values are aligned, you know, certainly Baylor and, and, and care for people. And so um, just saw it as a, a great experience for me to professionally grow um, and continue to, to, to develop. Uh, but it wasn't something I would say by any means was, was, was expected or, or anticipated or forecasted, you know, previously in my, my, my athletic trajectory for sure. Say that number again. So how many people in Almost total? Almost 600 employees, are... five, five, 582, 582 wow. employees. Yeah. yeah. And, and we actually were higher than that pre-COVID. So yeah. um, it's a it's a big, it speaks to this, to this, this scope and all the different things that we do. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's certainly a, a growing company, but it's, it's one of the largest private companies by far in, in, in the Waco community for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, Grace Urbanke is tuned mm -hmm. in. And Grace says, uh, Papa won't let me ask a question, but you're a keeper. So oh. that sounds like the best endorsement you'll get today. Thank you, Grace. You are too. <laughs> That's great. Doug, we hear about uh, the Magnolia Network coming soon, Discovery yeah. Plus. Uh, what's on the horizon there? What can we look forward to it, with that? There's a lot happening. We're, we're really, really excited. In fact, today's a big day for us. Uh, we've got an announcement coming at 2 o'clock. Um, that will really spell out uh, exactly what what the future holds for us. Um, but you know, we signed a, a relationship with Discovery, one of the largest uh, you know network cable company networks in 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 the world. Um, has a huge international presence beyond just the U.S. We signed a deal with them in April of 20 uh, excuse me 2019. It's almost two years ago. Um, to with the original intent to, to rebrand the DIY network to make that the Magnolia Network. Um, and we certainly recognized that the importance of the digital piece would, would, would come along with it. Um, and that, that the, the, the trends in, in, in media content consumption was certainly working the way where more and more people were streaming, more and more people were going direct to consumer as opposed to just the traditional cable linear television packages. So we, we, uh, we signed that deal in April and we've been working towards it. We had the intention of the fall of, of 2020 to launch the network, rebrand the network. And then Obviously, COVID happened and everything stopped with COVID. And you know, one thing people don't realize probably is filming stopped with COVID. For the most part, you, you'll see a big gap in in new content that you see across the board, whether it be movies or or TV shows, et cetera. Everything happened. It stopped for an extended period of time, including the content that we were creating. And so, 
we realized that we weren't going to go fall of 2020. We needed to push back into 2021. And during that time, you know, the acceleration of people cord cutting, as they say, cutting their cable packages and going into the streaming platforms just accelerated a hyper rate. COVID, you know, just just moved that much further along than even the industry expect, experts expected. And so you know, for us, we have um, recognized that moment, how critical for the network it is that we have a prominent presence on the digital side of things. And so um, in January of this year, Discovery launched uh, Discovery Plus, D Plus as they refer to it. It's their competitor to D Disney Plus, to Paramount, to Peacock, to all these other streaming platforms that you're seeing out there. And um, competitive advantage for Discovery is just the, the volume of reality television hours that they've got that are available in that, in that app offering. And so you can go to Discovery Plus, download that, uh, that app, um, and as part of that, we wanted to get some of our content out. Uh, and so there's a Magnolia network preview within Discovery Plus, um, where you can see all of the first season of, of, of Joe's cooking shows, which have done incredibly well. You can see um, the, the new season of our Fixer Upper. There are two in there. There's a new one dropping each Friday for the next couple of weeks. So a lot of new content that um, that we have we have uh, been a part of and Chip and Joe have, have curated and helped produce um, and, and ultimately, we will, we will go forward um, with our own network later this year. And like I said, the specific dates and all the details will be rolled out. But the bottom line is we're really, really excited because you're going to see a lot more Magnolia content over the course of 2021 and even into early 2022. And uh, benefit from that is that we just, our consumers, I think, are extremely excited about it. And they've come to love Chip and Joe through Fixer Upper. And I think they're just anxious and eager to hear what's next for them and what they're going to be putting together. Um, and so I think but the, the net sum for us as a business is, is that's, that's what's built the company, the, the exposure associated with, you know, Fixer Upper, five season of, of Fixer Upper um, is what helped make uh, the platform possible for what we get to exist on today. And uh, there's no question that now with this new media content rolling out that you'll see over the next uh, few months, that there's just an, an incredible opportunity available for us again. And all the, you know, ancillary aspects of our business, it's kind of that rising tide um, lifts all boats mentality. I think we're just going to see um, e extremely uh, positive uh, and, and large exposure opportunities for us as a brand, as a company. And that's just another reason why I'm re really bullish and excited about where we're heading and, and what the next uh, next few years look, look, like, look, look looks, looks like for us. Wow, man, that's exciting. So you've got an announcement coming up at two o'clock this afternoon. Two o'clock. I I tell you, we're, when you get when you get hooked up with publicly traded companies, they get real tight on embargoes of content right. that can be released. So you, 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 I'm a little bit more tight lipped than I'd like to be, but gotcha. um, it'll it'll spell out exactly what our plan is, the dates associated with it, how you can you can you'll be able to get our content. Um, we think we're really excited about it because we think it's a they're going to be the easiest way for our consumers to to get Magnolia content, um, and we think it's it's cutting edge in terms of the industry and going to put us in the forefront and create an experience that we can really be proud of. So a lot of work. It's been, like I said, almost two years to get to this point um, and uh, full details rolling out today. And, and we're only a few months away from, from seeing it come to fruition. Wow, man, that's great. Now, is that is that two o'clock Eastern or two o'clock Central? 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central. Oh, gotcha. I was going to yeah. say, if it's yeah, two getting, Eastern, we're yeah, an we hour keep you till the top of the hour and we get it live from you. So. Probably good. You're right. We're only missing it by about an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. We're not going to push any harder on that. Uh, a question from Kyrie Cameron, who is tuned in, says, which show on the Magnolia Network are you most excited about? Well, obviously, I'd, I'd be in trouble if I didn't say the ones that Chip and Joe are in. Um, sure. But, that, which they are great. I, I, don't, I don't have to lie to yeah. say that. They're, Joe's cooking show is awesome. Um, and Chip and Joe are funny as ever in, in Fixer Upper. But I'll tell you, I love Lost Kitchen. There's a show on there called Lost Kitchen. Um, and we actually put the full season in there. It's the story of a um, of a restaurant in Freedom, Maine, middle of nowhere, Maine, um, that's open from March to September only because of the season. And yeah. it only takes reservations via postcard mail-in. Um, and it's just a, it's beautiful, beautiful photography of, of just the cinematography of the, of the shots are incredible, amazingly talented, um, owner chef of that restaurant. I think it's a really well done story. It's, it's, and it's just the kind of story that Chip and Joe want to be in the business of telling. Um, but I would encourage those people that have access to discovery plus, and if you don't have access, access to discovery plus get it because lost kitchen's a great show that I think you'd, you'll, you'll all enjoy watching. 
That's cool. That sounds yeah. great. That's a good yeah. recommendation. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Paul Bloss says, why doesn't Magnolia put a Baylor sports show with J-Mo on? We'll wow. talk about that later. Thank you, yeah. Paul. Um, here's a guy that's tuned in. His name is Greg Davis, and he oh, says, what, who was your favorite men's basketball player during your undergraduate? It wasn't days? Greg. I'll tell it you, that wasn't, wasn't Greg. Greg. Yeah, it wasn't Greg. No, he's not going to put me on the spot like that. We had so many good ones, so many legends. Um, you know, there, there were some good ones going around. Um, Greg, Greg, Greg and I, roommates, Jason Pritchard, we, we had some, some great times and some great memories, but I, I won't call anybody out. There's, there's too many good ones that, that, that I don't want to, I don't want to single somebody out in that list. I think he was fishing for, uh, himself, right? Yeah. Well, clearly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Trey Hagens follows that up by saying, how many times did Greg Davis foul out of a game? Is it a BU basketball record? It's close. If Bill Kennedy, who's retired as a referee, was calling the game, you knew it was guaranteed that Greg was going to foul, foul out because at some point in his career, he did something to upset Bill Kennedy. But who can forget the best Greg Davis moment is when we went back to the pit and played in oh, the yeah. NIT. And they didn't care for Greg. I don't know why, but there was a yeah. lot of booze and un, unpleasant things being chanted from the crowd. Just I think that were completely unfair because Greg's such a wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> um, but, uh, it was a good time. We didn't pull out the victory largely because Greg couldn't hit a free throw if he fell out of a boat in the middle of the ocean. Um, but, uh, we had a, uh, we had a good time there and had a, a, a great experience despite the, the, uh, negative outcome of the game. That was, that was a memorable trip. That was definitely memorable. That was very memorable. Hey, question is how can we view your Magnolia announcement coming up at 2 p.m. Central today? Yeah, it will just be uh, through social media, through it's not a there's nothing video wise. You'll see if you're on the Magnolia um, email list uh, that there'll be an email going out. All the social media will point to it. So if you follow us on Magnolia social or Chip and Joe social, it'll all be directing and giving people direction on it in terms of what's what's next. And you'll be able to jump on to Magnolia.com this evening and, and read up and get a little detail of, of what, what what it will look like. Perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. You mentioned something about um, uh, discovery being worldwide, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that was part of your thinking, you know, and associating with them. What, what's the what's the uh, worldwide audience for uh, Chip and Joe and yeah. Fixer Upper and Magnolia? Uh, you know, I got to think, you know, the people that come to Waco, not just from the United States, but they probably are from all over the world. Huge. You know, we get a lot of visitors from Australia. That we'll, that we'll see at the silos. A lot from Australia, plenty from Canada. Um, Germany has a lot. You know, we can, we can see where, where online activity is coming from. Um, and so they do have an international presence. You know, they're, they're, they're well known and, and uh, widely loved in the U.S., but their reach goes beyond that. But we, it, you'll, you'll be stunned with the amount of folks from Australia that we'll see coming through there um, to the silos. So they, they definitely have a, a reach that, that is mind-blowing mind for sure. Now, are they seeing Fixer Upper in English, or has it been translated into oh, foreign yeah. languages? No, they've they've translated it, and you see, you can see it in all different languages across wow. across the globe. I mean, their books. You know, we've got some books in in Chip and Joe's office that are like that are that are in different languages. That uh, you know, just just goes to. I mean, they, they sell books all around the world um, that are in the respective language of that country. So it's it's incredible to see their their reach and and how how loved they are across across the world. Man, that's great. Yeah. Well, you've got a great group there too, don't you? I mean, I, I know some of the people that work at Magnolia yeah. and uh, I just think very highly of, of everybody that I know there. You really do have a good, uh, good group running Magnolia. Really proud of our team. We, we, uh, we do. We, we get to work with awesome people. I would say uh, one of the common denominators, when you, when you add in Chip and Joe, uh, I think our leadership team is 14 people and 12 either went to Baylor have a kid that went to Baylor or are married to a Baylor grad. So um, we definitely are well represented as a, as a company that uh, loves their green and gold, obviously Chip and Joe right at the for forefront of that, but um, really blessed with a lot of amazing folks that make coming to work really easy. Love it, man. All right. We're going to wrap things up, but uh, really appreciate uh, you answering all those questions. We had a lot of really good questions today and uh, uh, you know, I love you and you know, uh, it's great to visit with you in any format, but to do this and kind of share it with everybody, it's been fun. I appreciate you. I, and I would be remiss not to say how much I love you, JMO, the best ambassador for the university loved by all the broadcasters, media people that, that interact with you. Well, I don't know if we will ever truly, uh, 
have enough appreciation for Scott Drew, I would say the same thing's true for you. Just someone who's a great ambassador and um, privileged to call you a friend. Very nice. Hey, thanks for doing this. I know everybody that's uh, been tuned in uh, has enjoyed it and it'll be archived so people will watch it, you know, in uh, perpetuity. So it's great to visit with you and thanks for agreeing to do this today. Absolutely. Thanks, Jamma. All right. Best to you and Lacey. Thanks very much. Thank you, buddy. All right. Doug McNamee with us today and uh, the president of Magnolia. Think about that. Think about all that that encompasses. And he kind of shared, uh, you know, the many uh, tentacles of Magnolia and how well he do is doing in that job and how well he represents uh, uh, you know, Baylor uh, in coming from Baylor to take over there at Magnolia. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, everybody stay safe, stay warm, throw another log on the fire and just stay inside, but be very careful on the roads out there, especially here in Central Texas. It is really, really treacherous today. So be very careful. And uh, we appreciate uh, Walter and Paul and Tess and everyone that made this available today. Thanks for being with us. Be safe and sick of bears.